study or MRI studies you do to light up those organs, especially in the brain and uh, heart and the veins, arteries, all that wonderful stuff. But of course, in radiology, we do it as well. And I'm sure some of you by now in clinic have experienced the use of contrast media, i.e. barium for most of you, I'm assuming. But sometimes, of course, if they can't use barium, they're going to use things like Omnipake, Isobu, some uh, non-ionic contrast mediums for the patient tolerance levels. So we've all experienced that a little bit, and it's a huge part of what we do in radiology. We're going to talk a little bit about those specifically today. We're not going to list them all because we'd be here for an entire semester if I went through every single contrast media that we actually utilize in radiology. We're going to focus on the main ones, especially in the field of x-ray specifically that you will see. And we'll talk, touch a little bit on the other modalities as well, but not to the extreme. Just what you need to know for your registry, as always. So we do have what we call five radiographic densities. And those are listed right there on the left side of the screen right there for you. Those are the five types of radiographic densities that we have specifically in the field of radiologic sciences. And those are air, also labeled as gas, fat, Yes, fat is a radiographic density. Water, mineral, and metal. Of course, metal being the one that we want to see the least because metal is going to cause what we call extreme artifacts in every type of radiologic modality that we utilize energy in. Metal is our worst enemy. But of course, some patients have metal naturally inside of them from surgeries, dental fillings, or even foreign bodies, and that can't be helped. But if it can be helped, we want to make sure that metal is out of the way especially on clothing, which is why that dressing instruction is so very important anytime, anytime we get our patient ready for any kind of procedure, even just the simplest chest x-ray or KDB. So that's our five radiographic densities, which you see here on the right is a excretory urogram. What they, uh, you'll learn more about that in Red Pro 4, but they're basically doing a study of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, lining up those renal pelvises in the kidneys right up here. Lining up those ureters going down all the way to the bladder, doing a good analysis of that urinary system, utilizing a contrast medium. Now, this wouldn't be barium. This would be more likely Omnipake or Isobu. You wouldn't typically put barium on a urographic study. Barium, for the most part, is going to be on our oral studies where we swallow the barium or we inject it recti rectally for barium enemas. Things like the urinary system, they're going to use uh, more of those non-ionic contrast medias like Isobu, Omnipate, because you couldn't inject barium through the urethra. That'd be very painful. Barium's very thick. If you can use your imagination, injecting thick barium through someone's urethra would not end well for that poor individual. Would not work. It'd be very painful, very uncomfortable. So why do we do contrast studies? What's the main purpose? Well, you see your definition right there. We want to visualize anatomic structures that are not normally, keyword not normally seen on a diagnostic medical image. So who here can just fire off some anatomy to me that you wouldn't normally see on a normal x-ray? It can be any kind of x-ray. I'm talking about chest, abdomen, whatever. What's the we're not going to normally see on a plain x-ray without contrast? Who can tell me? AUV. <laughs> Any kind of x-ray. What's something that you would not normally see? KUB. You said KUB? Yeah, like where you can see the intestines. Well, not you, know? not so... Yeah. Right, so there, there you go. Intestines are a good example. Now, sometimes we can see intestines when they're air-filled. That is one of our radiographic densities. If there's a lot of air or fecal material in the intestines, we can see them. But if that is absent, they're going to be naturally quite invisible on that KUB. What else? Things like the stomach, the gallbladder, spleen, liver, the bladder, the actual urinary bladder, the ureters, the kidneys, like I just talked about. Those are all organs that we're not typically going to see unless we inject that contrast either intravenously, orally, rectally, whichever way. So that's the main purpose of a contrast study. We want to light up those anatomic structures not normally seen on a diagnostic medical image to get better visualization and better analysis for that radiologist to do any kind of diagnosis if there's any issues going on in those internal structures. And things like the brain as well, the, um, the esophagus, that's some more examples right there for you. Brain's a big one when you go into CT and MRI. You've got to light that brain up with all kinds of contrasts. You can see it without contrast, but things like the ventricles, 
you're not going to see that very well unless you inject that contrast medium intravenously. That's what I'm talking about right there. On the left side, we have an upper GI. And who here has done an upper GI? I'm sure someone here has done an upper GI by now, yes? Yeah, a couple of you, okay. Obviously, we're not going to see the stomach in quite as much detail unless we ingest that barium to light up that organ. It gives a nice, beautiful picture like you see right here. On the right side, we have an esophagram going on right here. Part of the stomach lit up. The esophagus is lit up. That's the um, action of peristalsis that we can see right there. You can see right here there's a large volume of contrast in the proximal portion of the esophagus. It gets thinner and then bigger again. That's that contracting action of that esophagus pushing that barium down, which we call peristalsis. This is muscular contractions. And over here, you have someone that has a very odd-shaped esophagus. Look at all those squiggles. That is not normal for esophagus at all. But of course, we wouldn't be able to see that if we didn't have the patient ingesting barium. It's lighting up the esophagus so we can see, hey, this kid right here has got a major issue going on with this esophagus. It's all twisted on itself. It's strictured. So we need to make sure we do a surgery to fix that problem very fast because that patient can't swallow properly. And of course, down here, we have an axial view of a brain. And this is what I was talking about. We can see the brain normally, which you see these outer structures of the cerebrum and the cortex and the genu of the brain, but you also have the anterior horns and the posterior horns of the ventricles right here, lit up by that contrast medium. Before we introduce the contrast, these ventricles are going to be um, what we call radiolucent. We're not going to see them. They're blended with the brain tissue. But if there's a major issue going on in that brain, they're going to introduce that contrast just to take a quicker and better look at those ventricles and see if there's any issues going on inside that brain cavity. So light up those areas that we could not normally see of that brain. So light up those areas of those internal organs that we're not going to see, i.e. the digestive system, urinary system, um, all the systems really. There's different contrasts for all those different systems. And they absorb at different rates, they have different injection rates, they light up at different times. That's getting a little bit too complex. You get more into that with CT MRI. You time out that contrast to light up different parts of the body depending on what you want to see. But with x-ray, most of the time it's done by the act of swallowing the barium, injecting it rectally or intravenously or through the urethra for uh, cystogram studies, so on and so forth. Those are pretty instantaneous. They happen very quickly. Okay, so like I just said, guys, why are we doing contrast media? Once again, it's visualizing that anatomy not normally seen. Now, how does it do this? Now, this is a very key point. When you talk about these different effects that happen, um, in the physics world of radiology, you really want to focus on that photoelectric effect right there. That's the main way that that contrast media is lighting up because it's attenuating those x-rays very strongly, lighting up those organs so we can visualize them very beautifully on those x-rays. And it does that because we use what we call high atomic number elements. The contrast media that we use in radiology has a key characteristic of having a high atomic number. The higher the atomic number the more it attenuates x-rays. It's a very important point you want to write down right there. The higher the atomic number, the better it attenuates x-rays. So we opt for those high atomic numbers in our contrast mediums. And it achieves that by using what we call the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect in radiology is the main point of absorption of x-rays. All the, Most of the absorption that takes place Occurs due to the photoelectric effect. You don't want to forget that principle right there. It's very important. I just saw that on my test as well. I throw that to you in CT as well. We talk all about that photoelectric effect and those high atomic number elements. Now, of course, with every type of contrast beam we're going to talk about, we have what we call indications and contraindications, indications of why we would want to use the contrast, contraindications of why we would not want to use the contrast, things like allergies and reactions. And, of course, we have to have serious attention to those reactions because there are what we call mild, moderate, and severe reactions. And we're going to list all those as we move forward and describe them a little bit more. Main point there, contrast media takes advantage of that photoelectric effect, which is the main principle of absorption in radiology. And it takes advantage of those high atomic number elements because the higher the atomic number, the more the x-rays attenuate and the better visualization we get on those actual x-ray, CT, or MRI images. Now, 
Another thing you want to write down, and it doesn't really have anything to do with this class, but it's something I guarantee your registry will say. The photoelectric effect also causes the most patient dose of all the radiologic reactions. It's that main point of absorption. It's a very important point. They just had that on my test as well. But they'll put it in your x-ray test too. Very important concept. Can you repeat it one more time? About the photoelectric effect? The photoelectric effect contributes the most to patient dose out of all the interactions in the physics world of radiology. You got like the Compton effect, you got the pair production, you got all that stuff going on. Photoelectric contributes the most to patient dose. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so contrast media continued here. So human tissues, they inherently have what we call low subject contrast with each other. That's why we want to introduce these contrast mediums to raise the contrast levels. We have a comparison. In other words, low contrast is what's going to make those organs blend into the body naturally on x-ray. Introduce the contrast, the contrast medium. We're going to raise the image contrast of that organ so we can better visualize it on the x-ray. Now, we have what we call negative versus positive contrast agents. We'll talk about those in a minute. And same thing I just talked about, guys. The higher the atomic number, the more we're going to visualize it when we introduce that subject contrast. We want those high atomic numbers. And it's relying primarily on that photoelectric effect for that contrast visualization. Kind of repeat what we just said. Very important points to make sure you remember right there. Very important points. where the more I see this photoelectric effect and this contrast, I'm starting to have more PTSD from these questions I just did. Oof. They hammered it hard. They hammered it hard on this test. One thing you, all, you really want to focus on, because by the time you guys take your registry, they're really trending hard on um, all the examinations on uh, radiation protection. Like dose, dose is a really hot topic in radiology. So they're training very hard on dose-related questions and patient safety. So you can definitely expect that when you guys take your test next year. Or, yeah, yeah, a little more than a year. Do you guys know what I mean? Don't worry, we have an entire class on radiation protection that you're going to have with me next year. We'll hit all those major points again. Okay, so just to break down that photoelectric effect just a little bit further, guys, because it is so important. What's the photoelectric interaction that results in that X-ray photon being totally absorbed and not striking the image receptor? As I said before, that is the main point of absorption in the physics world of radiology. And it's also going to contribute the most to patient dose out of all the different interactions we have with those X-ray photons. So it's the act of that photon being totally absorbed and not actually striking image receptor. Very important definition there. Big gold star on that one. Okay, so our types of contrast media, we're going to talk about the negative versus positive because we do utilize both. So we talk about a negative contrast media. Very important definitions here, by the way. There's a lot of really important things on this, this PowerPoint, guys, that they're going to love to ask you questions on. When you see negative contrast medium, that's primarily talking about an element that's composed of a low atomic number. And it also, when it's utilized, it appears radiolucent, which means it's basically clear on the image. We see straight through it. It doesn't absorb the x-ray. It's radiolucent. A translucent, same principle, versus positive contrast medium. That's going to be composed of our higher atomic number elements. Therefore, that's the ones we want when we want to light up the organs. They're going to appear as radiopaque on the image. It means it lights up white. So basically, to put it in more simple terms, a negative contrast medium is going to appear more black, a positive contrast medium is going to appear more white on an x-ray image. The whiter it is, the more positive. The blacker it is, the more negative. Also, the lower the atomic number, the blacker. 
the higher the atomic number, the wider as it goes on appearance on the images. And then we have what we call specialty contrast agents. We're just going to list these. We're not going to really talk about them too much unless you go in those modalities later on. When it comes to ultrasound, they use a contrast agent. It's called a micro bubble. When we talk about MRI, they use primarily what we call gadolinium DTPA. Gadolinium is the most used contrast medium in MRI, but not the only one that's used. For CT, they're going to utilize a lot of the same ones we utilize in radiology. Why? Because CT is a high-powered X-ray. It's a spinning X-ray, basically, with a high-frequency generator. Therefore, it's still utilizing X-rays. It's going to use the same contrast we use using X-ray. We're just going to use them in different amounts to attenuate those structures and light them up in different ways for those different views that we're using in that media. Main point there, negative versus positive, guys. Negative low atomic number, radiolucent. Positive high atomic number, radiopaque. The more positive, the wider. The more negative, the blacker on those images. So if I asked you, for example, what kind of contrast media, negative versus positive, is air? What would you tell me? What does air look like on an x-ray image? It's going to be negative. It's going to be negative. Why? Because air looks negative. very black on an x-ray image. That's correct. Versus if I had the patient drink barium and his stomach's really white on the x-ray image, is that, is that barium a positive or negative contrast media? Positive. positive. Positive, that's right. Positive is going to light up that organ. It's a high atomic number. It's going to look white on the image. And that's what I was talking about right there. The more radiolucent, the blacker, the more radiopaque, the wider. So contrast mediums, of course, are going to fall into this more radiopaque category over here, but also things like metal. Metal appears very, very white on an X-ray image because it attenuates those X-rays super strong. I mean, it lights up like crazy. That's why it looks like a big artifact on our X-ray images. Things like bone. Bone are more radiopaque. Water and soft tissue, they're going to be right in the middle and appear more gray. When we go down the scale, the more radiolucent. Things like fat and gas are going to be very dark, very dark on those X-ray images. And there's your definitions right there. Once again, radiolucent, this is the the transparent, translucent images. Radiolucent means it's allowing those x-rays to pass through very easily, soft tissues. Whereas radiopaque, that's the material is not as easily penetrated by x-rays like bones. They absorb more x-rays, they attenuate more, therefore they light up and appear very white on our images. That's what that contrast media is going to do, the same concept. That's how we can view those organs more easily because they're not going to be as easily penetrated using those higher atomic numbers, attenuating those x-rays, let us visualize those organ structures a lot better and a lot easier overall. Okay, so when we say what would be the perfect contrast material, because there's a lot that we use, and we have the wide variety because, unfortunately, not every patient is built the same. We all have allergies. We have reactions. Certain contrast mediums can't be used with certain kinds of studies because they're too dangerous. But when we talk about an ideal person, ideal contrast material, these are what we want to see in that contrast medium right here. This is before you. These six bullet points. We want very High contrast visualization, it's very important because if we don't have that, guess what we're not going to see? We're not going to see the organs and um, tissues that we want to light up on those x-rays. Also, very important, we must have an extremely low toxicity of the patients. Low toxicity means that there's going to be less reactions, less severe reactions to the patient. It needs to be safe, essentially. The lower the toxicity, the safer the contrast medium. Because some of the contrast means we use in radiology are quite dangerous. They can cause extreme reactions to the patients. There must be what we call persistence in the patient anatomy until imaging is completed. What's that mean? 
And what's persistent means? It means that someone that like, doesn't give up. I'm very persistent that you guys learn this material. I'm not going to give up. Persistent means we want that material, that contrast, that contrast medium to stay in that organ as long as possible until we complete the study. So it must persist through the study. Persistence. Low cost. That's a big deal, too, because you know anything about medications, guys? It's a mess in the medical world today. And contrast media falls under medications. Therefore, they charge the hospitals an arm and a freaking leg for contrast. So this is why it's very important, guys, when I talk about um, documenting everything you do, that's one of the important things about documenting contrast because if you don't document those things properly, waste it, you're costing that hospital a lot of money. Guess what? That trickle down, trickles down to you. The more you cost the company, the less chances you have of getting raises, bonuses, things like that. So always do your part to save costs in a hospital because things like contrast media and medications, period, cost an insane amount of money. Very, very expensive. I mean, you're putting thousands of dollars of liquid in people with each of these exams. Looks like just cheap white barium, looks like milk and magnesia, but it costs a lot of money to that hospital. And um, more of those uh, non-ionic contrast means like OmniPake and Isotview, that's the ones that are getting to like hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. Um, things like extravasation. Oh, can you all hear me? You good? Can you all hear me? I swear, guys, I think WebEx just given up for the semester. <laughs> it's just given up. Wow. Okay, where do I leave off? Do I need to go back? Someone tell me where I left off. I'll go back and restate what I was saying. You were just finishing talking about the cost. Of like barium. Okay, so yeah, so low, yeah, so low cost, very important, guys. Uh, make sure you're not wasteful for those different contrast means you're using, and make sure you document every contrast you use because it is costing the hospital a lot of money to use those. We want minimal or no side effects, preferably none at all. That would be ideal. But when we talk about the perfect contrast material, we do accept what we call minimal side effects that is considered okay we like minimal side effects because they're not life threatening and of course no residual effects within the patient we don't want any kind of internal damage to be done to our patients and that can occur with what we call if you remember extravasation if it comes outside the if the contrast leaks outside the organ or outside the veins it can cause internal damage or what we call as residual effects within the patient so that's what we would call the perfect contrast media. It's all six of those main points right there. This way, most of our non-ionic contrast mediums, by the way, non-ionic contrast mediums, which we'll talk about more in a second, non-ionic is ideal because non-ionic contrast causes the least amount of reactions compared to the ionic contrast mediums. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, we're going to break it down a little further here. Okay, some key contrast characteristics. Seven great points right here. What do we look for in these contrast mediums? What must they have to be key contrast? Well, that agent must be able to mix with the body fluids. If it doesn't, it's just going to sit there and not move around. If it's just sitting there, it's not doing what it needs to do. It's not going to absorb into the tissues. It's not going to absorb into the organs. It's not going to move through the veins. It's just going to sit there and do nothing. So it must mix with the body fluids properly, i.e. blood, gastric fluids, fluids in the intestines, fluids in the gallbladder, whatever we're looking at, the urine, it has to mix properly. Viscosity, that's a big one right there. I put a big star on that one. Viscosity is a big deal in contrast. Does anybody remember what viscosity means? I know we've talked about it before. That's a huge point on contrast. Who can the define thickness. viscosity? The thickness the of thick the tissue. Contrast. Very good. And how do we reduce the thickness or viscosity of a contrast medium? Who can tell me? What do you think we would do to reduce that viscosity? Water it down. 
second. Water it down. Sorry, Jonathan, I couldn't understand you. Dilute it. Or dilute it, dilute it. Well, we can. We can. That is one way we can do it. That would be more so in the barium realm. But for the most part, what we're going to do is we're actually going to heat it up. As you heat contrast up, the viscosity goes down. So when you guys start rotating an MRI and CT in the next couple semesters, you'll notice all the contrast is kept in a heater. They keep it at a certain temperature level to lower that viscosity. And that's really more so important when we're talking about doing intravenous contrast because think about it. If you have a very thick contrast, is it going to move through the veins? No, it's going to get stuck in there. It must be a low viscosity at the time of injection to flow properly through those veins to get to the structures it needs to light up fast and efficiently. So we always keep it in a higher temperature to lower that viscosity because it's very thick, quick, very quickly. Ionic strength, it must have a strong ionic power to dissociate those ions properly depending on the type of contrast we're using. Persistence in the body, we just talked about that. We want to be persistent in the organ that it's lighting up. The tissue that it's lighting up needs to stick there for the whole study. Otherwise, it's useless to us, and we have to inject more contrast, thus raising the risk that that patient could have some kind of adverse reaction. Iodine content, very important. Iodine content relates to the atomic number of that contrast. We utilize iodine content in most of our contrast mediums to raise the atomic number so it attenuates properly and lights up those tissues beautifully on those x-rays. Osmolality. Osmolality refers to how it travels with the blood, how it mixes with the blood. We'll talk more about that one in a second. It also has a uh, added risk that the higher the osmolality, the more risk it is to the patient. So we want to balance on that osmolality. And then the potential for toxicity in other words, how badly is that going to react with a patient who has an allergy to a contrast? We want lower toxicity for lower adverse effects to protect our patients because above, above all else, we want to keep our patients safe. doesn't matter how good I think my image should be, patient safety becomes, it's always the number one thing that we do in every, every single study that we do in this field. Okay, so our most popular contrast choices, and this is in the realm of x-ray diagnostic imaging that you guys are in right now. This is not referring to the other modalities. Barium sulfate, of course, I think everyone by now has, has at least seen barium sulfate or utilized it in some way. This we're going to use on most of your things like upper GIs, esophagrams, speech pathology studies, barium enemas, so on and so forth. Most of your digestive exams will utilize that barium sulfate. Air and gas, yes, air and gas is considered a contrast, even though it's a negative contrast. If any of you have done an upper GI, for example, my upper GI people, who can give me an example of the utilization of an air contrast in upper GI? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So there's a little something you give your patients before they have an upper GI. Does anybody remember what that is? It's done in upper GI. Little, little things. What I'm talking about these little or something. Yeah, yeah. The little crystals, the little crystals. They like I call them the fizzy crystals. But we have patients ingest those prior to an upper GI to create gas because it makes them want to burp. Why do we want that? Because most upper GIs are what we call the double contrast study. If you remember double contrast, it utilizes air and barium to get a different type of density within that organ for better visualization. We would use that as a contrast media. So air is a negative contrast media. We're using it with the barium combination to get a more beautiful visualization of those organs. We'll also use much less overall in our field um, oil-based iodine contrast agents that would be for specialized studies or patients that are having certain allergies. And then we will use a lot of what we call water-soluble iodine contrast agents. For example, if a patient had an allergy to barium sulfate, we would utilize the water-soluble iodine contrast agent because that would be an alternative to the barium should they have a certain kind of allergy, and vice versa. So we have all, these are not all of them listed. There's a lot more than this, but these are the most popular. We're going to use an x-ray most of the time, most of the time. And you'll see a lot more as you're out there. You'll see a lot more. Am 
And by the way, those water-soluble iodine contrast agents, they taste terrible. I always feel sorry for patients that have to use those, have to drink them. It's like drinking just pure, bitter liquid. It's nasty. I've tried all of them because I'm curious like that. I'm curious like that. I've tried barium sulfate. I've tried all of them. I've even tried the crystals because I'm like, you know what? If I expect my patients to ingest it, I better know what it tastes like too. So there you go. If you want to know what barium sulfate tastes like, it tastes like milk and magnesium, literally. It's same texture, same taste. What we used to actually do at Texas Children's, because if you can imagine, getting kids to drink this stuff is a nightmare. We actually always had a uh, bottle of Hershey syrup that we'd pour in the barium and mix it. And we'd tell them we're making a chocolate milkshake. It doesn't help a lot, but kind of a placebo effect, a mental effects they think it's a chocolate milkshake they're going to cooperate with you a little more now, as far as those water soluble ones i don't care how much chocolate chocolate you put in that there ain't nothing that will make that taste better that's just just pray if you ever have to have a contrast today they don't make you drink omni paper ice it's going to be the worst thing you ever drink it's nasty it stays in your mouth it's like a metallic taste it's gross so there you go guys for uh Oh, you've tried Omnipake? It's pretty gross, huh? It's really bitter. Really bitter. So, uh, you know, next time we convene, guys, you know, if we get to see each other before the holidays, I'll, I'll get some eggnog and make some barium eggnog shakes. Uh, that'll be my special Christmas gift to you guys. Yes. Barium eggnog shake. I mean, that is my special recipe. The best. I serve it to all my family members every year. I tell you. No, I probably wouldn't be invited anymore if I did that. <laughs> So you can stay home. We don't want none of that. It's nasty. I do love eggnog, though. I'm, eggnog does not love me, but I do love eggnog. It's like my favorite thing to drink at the holidays. Um, if you can imagine a, a severe lactose intolerant guy drinking eggnog, it's not a pretty picture, but man, it sure is good. It sure is good. Okay, so talking about those contrast media choices here, guys. Now, look, these are some very important numbers to write down because. These atomic numbers are a huge deal in utilizing correct um, contrast media to attenuate those x-rays properly. So there's our popular ones again right here. Barium. Barium, you don't want to forget that atomic number. It has atomic number 56, the highest of all those, as you can see, listed. That's why it attenuates those x-rays so well. That's why it looks so white on those x-ray images. That's going to be our ideal choice. Iodine-based, things like Omnipake and Isobu, is going to be atomic number 53. And they're always going to utilize iodine with that atomic number of 53 to light up those tissues properly. And you'll look down there on the third one, the air and gas, it's going to have the lowest. That's why it's going to look so black on the image. It's going to have an average atomic number of 8. Therefore, it's going to appear very black or dark gray on our X-ray images. Because the lower the atomic number, the less it attenuates. Higher, the more it attenuates. Eggnog is good with a little Bailey's. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> Although I gotta say, I actually prefer the just the, the Borden's eggnog, like just the plain Borden's eggnog. It doesn't have alcohol in it. It's just it's so good. It's so good. I love it. It's so yummy. Once again, it doesn't love me, but I sure love it. Do we get, wait, do we get an on the house what? Let me see that. Oh, y'all having some kind of conversation about alcohol there. I'll let y'all keep going. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little more about barium sulfate. We're going to um, list some of the characteristics because, like I said, guys, you're all going to use this at some point. This is, this is, X-ray 101, you're going to use barium sulfate at some point in your career. If you think you're not, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You're still going to use it at some point. So barium sulfate, the chemical name right there, the simplified chemical name, BASO4. That's very important to make sure you remember right there. I hate chemistry too, but you know you need to know the chemical names. BASO4. It's also a compound suspension. It has a characteristic of what we call Flocculation. Well, that's a fun word. You know, I love my fun words. That's one of those ones you want to use at the dinner table, Christmas or um, <laughs> or Thanksgiving. Say, so, man, that turkey's flocculating on that table. 
That turkey's flocculating in my stomach. Sounds terrible, right? But I love it. Flocculation means something that's clumping together. Literally. We want the barium to clump together because if it doesn't clump together in the stomach, for example, we're not going to see the stomach very well. If it doesn't clump together in the intestines, we're not going to see it very well. So flocculation is a key characteristic of that barium sulfate. It's also what we call inert, which means it has a lack of reaction or physiologic activity within the human body. It has a very low rate of negative reactions in the human body. This is why we utilize it so much. And also, um, it helps push fluid. Uh, it can push fluid falling barium states to push it through the rest of the body. For example, we might follow barium with some water. If it clumps too much and sits there too long, we can push it through the rest of the body by utilizing water, air, whatever we want to use. I still love that word flocculation. I gotta use that one here. Man, mom, that turkey was good, but sure is flocculating in my intestines. I'm gonna look at me like I'm crazy. That pumpkin pie sure flocculated. Woo! Man. I love, I love crazy words like that. It just makes those dinner conversations so much more awkwardly hilarious. What are you talking about at your dinner table? Sports? Huh? Sports or what? Politics? That's boring stuff. You got to talk about flocculation to dinner table, I'm telling you. Doesn't beat that. Okay, so barium studies of the GI tract, guys. One thing you do have to make sure, you, even though it has a very low reaction rate overall, it's very safe. Like any contrast medium, there's still a chance of danger. So one thing we have to be very cautious of is if there is a suspected bowel perforation, in other words, a perforated bowel basically be a hole in the bowel, what's going to happen if there's a hole in the bowel? It's going to leak out. And much like that same concept of contrast leaking out of the veins, extravasation of the colon or bowels can occur with barium sulfate. Same exact concept. If it leaks outside the organs, guess what is happening? It's going all over the body. It's going to cause major issues, infections. Um, it can actually cause death as well. So anytime we see there's a suspicion of bowel perforation, we're never going to use barium sulfate. It's too dangerous to use. That's a very important point. Bowel perforation is a huge contraindication against using barium sulfate. Oh, you ain't seen any of my jokes yet. You want some corny jokes? I got lots more to come. I got a lot more jokes to come. Don't you worry. I mean, I'm known for my terribly corny jokes. I mean, they just cause the biggest face palms and the biggest groans you've ever seen in your life. You know, I gotta save some for later, though. I can't. I can't. You know, use them all in one semester. So, and by the way, if you look at these two pictures here, guys, who can tell me what's different between these two colon studies? What's a very key difference between those two? It goes back to the second chapter we had this semester. Very good. Single versus double. The left would be a single contrast study. We're not using any air. We're only using primarily barium. Versus the right, you can see the black and white streaks going on through the colon. That's air combined with barium. And overall, that's going to give you a better visualization of that colon. Especially if there's polyps in there, you'd be able to see those polyps a lot easier in that colon. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about our water-soluble contrast agents and ionics versus non-ionics. Now, once again, these are only going to be used in x-ray if they want to see something in a different um, type of density as far as organs, or if the patient has like an allergy to barium sulfate, they might use one of these. Or if the doctor just prefers using it, period, because some doctors have a preference of contrast that they utilize. And of course, we're never going to utilize contrast until we have the doctor's permission. You remember that. We never utilize it because it is considered medication. You've got to get that written order from that doctor before we utilize it. Uh, we can't make that decision ourselves. So let's talk about the iod uh, ionic contrast agents. First of all, now these are going to be used primarily, as the name says, iodine as the contrast material. Why, once again? Because iodine has a higher atomic number 
It attenuates the x-rays better. It lights up those organs in a more reliable fashion. Now, ionic contrast agents are going to have a very key characteristic in that they dissociate the two ions. When they enter the body, this dissociation occurs, and the two ions that they dissociate into, dissociate means splitting apart, by the way, they're going to, they're going to dissociate into an anion and a cation. The anion is a negative charged ion. Cation is a positive charged ion. Very important concepts to remember there on those. Now, ionic contrast agents are not the preferred contrast agent to utilize in X-ray studies. And the reason for that is an ionic contrast agent has a much higher risk of a reaction in a patient than a non-ionic contrast medium. And the reason for that is because of that dissociation of the two ions. That dissociation principle will cause more adverse effects in our patients. Thus, it's much more risky to use ionic contrast agents. So we're only going to utilize it if that doctor knows for sure that patient is not going to have a reaction negatively to that contrast agent. So more risky to use overall, also more expensive to use overall compared to our non-ionic contrast mediums. Mr. Donahue, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought a cation was negative and an anion was positive. So that's a very common mistake. So you're thinking of cathode anode. Okay. The X-ray tube. So that's I'm glad you brought that up, as Betty, because that used to mess mess me up too. So don't mix that up with your cathode and anode, guys. Cathode and anode are the parts of the X-ray tube. The cathode is negative. The anode is positive. But when it comes to the ions. On ionic contrast agents, the anion is negative, the cation is positive. Don't mix those up. Be very careful. Very, very careful. Easy mistake to make. I'm glad you brought that up. Write those down. Put a big star on them. I made that same mistake as well. Okay, so when we talk about ionic contrast agents, they also have what we call osmolality. Now, what's osmolality defined? That is the measure of the total number of particles in solution per kilogram of water. It also is a way that we relate that contrast to the actual um, thickness of the blood. There's a comparison with the blood so that the viscosity is the same level as blood, so it travels more naturally through the veins and arteries. Um, and we have more adverse reactions the higher the osmolality of the agents. It's a very important concept as well. So when we talk about ionic contrast media, they have a high osmolality. That's why they cause more reactions overall. So the higher the osmolality, the more likely a contrast reaction will occur, a negative contrast reaction like an allergy or a dangerous reaction in the patient. So high osmolality is a bad thing overall, but sometimes we must utilize it. That's what the doctor needs to properly visualize what he's wanting to look at inside the body of the patient. So let's talk about our non-ionic contrast agents now. These are the ones that we ideally want to use. So non-ionic contrast agents are excellent because they do not dissociate into the anions and cations. So if they're not dissociating, guess what they're not doing as much? Causing negative reactions to the patients. They're also water-soluble. And what this means is they're safer. For example, if a patient was to have an extravasation outside the veins or outside an organ into the surrounding tissues, Water-soluble means that it's going to absorb in the body a little quicker, a little more naturally. It still cause issues, but if a contrast agent is not water-soluble and it extravasates, it's going to cause a lot more danger in reactions to that patient. So we, will, we always want to opt for those water-soluble when possible. Because overall, because they do not dissociate and because they are water-soluble, they're going to cause a lot less reactions to our patients. Excuse me. Hiccups. <coughs> Excuse me. 
They also have a key characteristic of having six iodine atoms per molecule. That's great because it's going to raise that atomic number up. It's better attenuation of those x-rays. It also has increased solubility in plasma, which means it's going to flow through those veins a lot easier, flow through those arteries a lot easier, and not be clogged up by that plasma found in our blood and our cardiovascular system. And make sure you look at this chart right here. You have to duplicate this chart for me on your next test. This is a perfect recreation of a non-ionic contrast agent. In fact, it's so well done, I have no idea what it even refers to. But <laughs> make sure that you duplicate that for me on the next test. It's gonna be your, um, we'll make that your bonus question. How about that? No, no don't worry. You're not, good. You're not going into this field to be chemists. You don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about that. That's my weakest subject, by the way, chemistry, my worst subject on earth. I can study it all day, every day for weeks and still not know what I'm looking at. Okay, so some more advantages here, guys, that are non-ionic. By the way, when you see non-ionic, there's another way that can be classified. See right here. L-O-C-M. Sometimes it will be referred to as L-O-C-M as opposed to non-ionic, but they both mean the exact same thing. Does anybody know or want to take a crack at what L-O-C-M stands for? Anybody guess? I'll give you a clue. No. Low osmolality contrast medium. There you go. There you go. Low osmolality contrast medium. That's another way of saying non-ionic. They're synonymous terms. Make sure you know both of those. They'll interchange them sometimes. So, of course, as it says in the name, one of those great advantages is that low osmolality. Also, the lack of ionic breakdown makes it less toxic at a cellular level. It's much more water-soluble in blood plasma, which can protect us if we have any extravasations. And one really key feature of that NII is that it's going to warm, I'm sorry, warmth, increased temperature is going to increase the viscosity, making it flow a lot easier through the veins especially, but throughout the body overall. The higher the viscosity, we want high viscosity, the higher the viscosity, the more it flows easier. Viscosity referring to that thickness. So obviously, we had the choice. We're always going to go for that non-ionic LOC on contrast media over the ionic. Just because it's so much less riskier to use overall, and the cost is a lot less overall. Should it be warm to decrease viscosity? Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Okay. I should say decrease. I'm sorry. Typo. We never warm to increase. Thank you, sir. Yes, make sure that says decrease, guys. We warm it to decrease viscosity. Okay, some more great advantages here. It's less likely to cause those patient reactions. Once again, that occurs because it's not dissociating in those ions which is cations. It's more tolerable by our patients, referring to it causing less allergies overall. The high conscious effect results from the number of iodine atoms that's increasing the atomic number to increase the attenuation. I keep saying that over and over again, so that's a very important point, guys. When I repeat stuff a lot, that's a huge point to remember. And also, it's going to reduce the injection volumes. That refers to we don't have to actually use as much contrast in comparison to the ionic, much less overall, thus um, costing the patient less, costing the hospital less, and reducing that any kind of adverse reaction or effect could happen, which increases as we use more contrast. We're going to use a lot less overall on those low osmolality contrast mediums or also called non-ionic contrasts, mediums. And 
with that, guys, I am out of time. And I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, did I have a schedule for a test on Wednesday in this class? We're going we're gonna to move that to Friday, guys. So it took a little longer than I was expecting. We're going to move that test to Friday. So we'll finish up this chapter on Wednesday, and we'll do a in-class review of all the information. Um, are there any questions on what we talked about today, guys? All right. Well, enjoy your next class, guys. I will send you the PowerPoint so far. Oh, by the way, um, by the way, I did add three points to your last test grade, guys. I threw out that one question that was in dispute. So everyone got three points on their last test grade in this class. And I know um, I, I'm going to get to your image of you guys. I know all, a lot of you have been texting me. Starting on Wednesday, we're going to start knocking the image reviews out and put you guys on a schedule, and we'll start taking care of all that as well. All right, guys. Well, enjoy your next class. Um, I will see you all at 1 o'clock, and we will get uh, finish up our Rad Pro chapter and review for our upcoming tests in that class as well. Take care. See you guys in a little bit. Bye-bye.